Honey Thompson. I'm a university distinguished professor at The Ohio State University uh, in the School of Earth Sciences and in the Bird Polar Research Center. You, you can go to the polar regions either by going to high or low latitude or by going to high elevation. So for the last uh, 35 years we've been perfecting the drilling of glaciers above 20,000 feet in remote parts of the world. And uh, quite a challenge. It takes a special team to do that and it takes special lightweight equipment to get it up to 20,000 feet uh, to drill the cores. And um, a number of years ago we uh, uh, developed the first solar powered ice core drill because if you go to the tropics and you go 20,000 feet you have over half the Earth's atmosphere below you. So every panel works 20 to 30 percent above manufacturer specs. So, and it's a beautiful source of power. Um, there's no pollution at the drill site. Uh, and uh, the only thing you have to worry about is that uh, in the tropics, uh, drilling starts when the sun comes up. You reach your maximum drilling rate at noon. And you got to make sure you get your drill up before sun sets in the evening. Keeping the ice frozen. I mean, we, you know, if you're working over in the Himalayas, uh, yeah, you're uh, in a very remote part of the world uh, that uh, the logistics, uh, food supplies, uh, medical kits, we have to take in everything so our team is self-sufficient. Couldn't do it without our colleagues in China uh, that uh, help us arrange uh, uh, the, uh, what we need in the way of logistics. But if you're drilling, the highest we've drilled is 23,500 feet the top of the Himalayas, a place called uh, Dasupu. Wonderful history of the monsoon uh, records. You can't get that out of the polar regions. And, but getting up there, living up there for uh, six weeks uh, is, a real, is a real challenge. And then keeping those cores frozen because uh, we use Sherpas uh, to backpack them from the high elevation down to the edge of the glacier. But even when you get to the edge of the glacier, you're still three or four thousand feet below where the trucks are out on the plateau. Then you've got to transfer that to special insulated boxes. And in that part of the world, we put those boxes on yaks that carry the cores down uh, to the trucks in the valleys below. And we drill five to six hundred meters of core and you can get uh, two of these insulated boxes on a yak. You, so you can get about uh, uh, twelve meters of core on one yak. So if you transporting 500, 600 meters, you gotta have a whole herd of yaks. And yaks are kinda like cats. They, they got a mind of their own, so you're trying to move them down, the, uh, down to where the trucks are. And, th and then once you get them to the trucks, there's a dash across the plateau to Lhasa, where there are freezers, where we can divide our samples between our Chinese colleagues, and then we air cargo them to Beijing, go through Chinese customs and air cargo them to Chicago uh, in the U.S. and go through U.S. customs and then we put them on freezer trucks and ship them down to Ohio State University. They're usually in transit for a month after we leave the field site. Uh, it's, a, it's a long story. It's actually it's a remarkable story in many ways. I grew up in a small town in, called Gasway in West Virginia, which is a coal mining state in the U.S. A uh, very poor family. Um, no one in my family had ever gone to college. And, but I was very interested in science. I knew that when I was in sixth grade. And so uh, there was a group of us, uh, about eight of us that hung out together. We, we competed with he, each other and all eight of this group went on to go to college. And uh, we got scholarships to go uh, and went to Marshall University. and. I started out in physics because I knew I wanted to be a scientist, but I wasn't sure what kind of scientist. But that kind of is the basis for any science. And then when I was a junior, I took a geology class. And I really liked it because you could see, it dealt with big processes, and you could see them, you could do this. And you wouldn't have to spend the rest of your life in, a, in, in an office building. You could go out in remote parts of the world and, and, and so I really, really like that. Uh, and then when I graduated from there, I went to Ohio State University to study coal geology because I grew up in West Virginia and as a young person, I was looking for a job, a good paying job. 
And I, uh, I was at Ohio State for about a quarter, and I got a message that there was an opening in what was then the Institute of Polar Studies to look at ice cores. And I'd had geomorphology, and I knew that uh, glaciers only cover 10% of the planet, and they're in places where people don't live, so how could they possibly be important? But if you took the research position, you could get your master's degree faster and therefore get out and get your job faster. So I took it, and it took about a year and a half of working with ice cores to start to realize what their potential was. And so uh, it's not like I started out in that direction. And so I always, always tell my students that, you know, and it's, it's true, most of them come, the families want them to get a good education and to get a good job, to have a secure life. But I tell them if they're really lucky, in this process, they will find their passion, the thing that they'll get up for every morning and go to work. And once you find your passion, you don't worry about anything else because it takes care of itself. I, I made uh, my first trip to Antarctica in 1973 as a graduate student. And the following year, uh, it, it's kind of interesting that uh, the way things come to be because uh, all the work at the time I started was on ice cores was being done in the polar regions, in Greenland and Antarctica. And all the pioneers in our field were alive, and I had a chance to meet them when I was uh, a student. And uh, it was uh, in 1973 that there were so many people working in Antarctica and, and, and Greenland that we came up with this idea that wouldn't it be great to have a record somewhere in between to compare, the, look at the connectedness between Antarctica, climate from Antarctica, and climate from Greenland. And so um, there was a, uh, a geographer who had made an atlas of the glaciers of the world. And he had all these aerial photos, and, and in this, these photos, we found this tropical glacier called Calcaya in the Andes of Peru, 18,670 feet. And, uh, took the photos to the, what was then the uh, polar programs, because they were the only agency at the time that funded ice core research, made a case to the program manager that wouldn't it be great to look at something in the low latitudes to connect to the high latitudes. And he listened and he said afterwards, his name was Jay Zawali, he said, you know, Lonnie, that sounds really interesting, but you know, I can't fund it because we can't fund anything that's not north of the Arctic Circle or south of the Antarctic Circle. So in 73-74, uh, in the winter, I went to Antarctica, and back then they had telexes. And in February, I got a telex from Jay Zawali saying, quote, that I have funded all of my real science projects, and I have $7,000 left. What could you do on that tropical glacier for $7,000? And I telex back and said, hey, I think, I think we could get there. And in the summer of 74, we made our first excursion to uh, Peru, up in the Andes, found this ice cap. And that opened up a whole new area of research. Uh, uh, not, not quickly, I might add, uh, because we, uh, it was clear there was a record there, but we still had to find the funding to be able to go there. And being young and naive, I thought, we would just uh, make a contract with the Proving Air Force and bring the drill and the generator from Antarctica, and we would fly the helicopter up through the Andes and get it up on the ice field, uh, get the drill out, drill the cores, put them into the helicopter, and fly them out. Well, that was a great idea, but uh, and when we got a contract, and we actually tried this in 1979, and uh, the uh, we had to fly the helicopter 13 hours to get it into the region, and there were no airports up there, so we had to bring the fuel in by train on a boxcar, and we staged out of the back of a small town in Sequani in the Andes. And, but when you got the helicopter up to 19,000 feet, it would, I mean, even in beautifully uh, blue skies, it would just fall because there were updrafts and downdrafts, and there was not enough air to support it. And, Eventually, the pilot said, uh, no, we can't, uh, we can't do this. Uh, uh, and, and so, I, I mean, it was my first really big failure. I mean, I've been funded by NSF to do this. I was told by the pilots they could do it. But in the end, they couldn't. And 
there was a two-day journey from the end of the nearest road to this ice cap, and so you could only get there either walking or using horses. And the drills from Antarctica were too big. Uh, the generator, could, no way you could put that on a horse. So that year, we actually went to the ice cap and we sampled down a crevasse. We got a record going back 25 years, which we published in Science. Um, and but it, it's one. Of, it's those things in life where you come to uh, a point where can, is this possible? I mean, you know, uh, and this was the first time we thought about using solar power because a panel, a solar panel can go into special made bags that can be put on horses and you can, uh, it's just, you need uh, 40 panels, you, you know, you get, to, you can get as many horses as you need to transport them to the edge of the ice. And so we came up with this idea and uh, we took panels there and sure enough, they performed 20 to 30 percent above specs uh, of manufacturers. But of course, we had to get reviewed for uh, uh, getting money to build a solar power drill. And this is 1983, and there's, solar power was just coming online. And, and so uh, Willie Dansgaard, who was one of the pioneers in our field, reviewed the proposal. And he sent me a copy of the review he sent to NSF, National Science Foundation. And it was very short. It said, the Kelkaya ice cap is too high for human beings and the technology does not exist to drill it. Therefore, you should not fund this project. And fortunately, there was a program manager who said, uh, who was interested in monsoons and had gotten his PhD studying monsoons. And he said, well, maybe Willie Dansgaard uh, is right, but we won't know unless we try. And so we built this solar powered drill. We tested on a parking garage in Columbus, Ohio. We brought in blocks of ice and we were able to drill through the blocks of ice. Looked like it would work. But two weeks before we left on the expedition to drill there, I passed the MBA exam, the Fisher School of Business, because this, if I failed, it would be my second failure. And I figured I'd need a new career line. Uh, and, and I really liked Willie Dansgaard. Uh, I'd read all of his papers when I was a student. And um, so we went down in uh, 1983, and we succeeded in uh, uh, not just drilling one quarter bedrock, but two, and bringing back 6,000 bottled water samples because we hadn't devised a technology to keep the ice frozen. But we could cut it, prepare it in the field, and, and carry it out with horses. And we brought it out, and one set of those samples I sent to Willie Dansgaard, who analyzed them, and it was such a fantastic record that from that day on, he was our greatest supporter on why we needed to drill in the high mountains around the world. Uh, but I'm, I'm a very firm believer in a 10,000 hour rule, that if you wanna be an expert in anything, you gotta be willing to put in 10,000 hours, which turns out to be about eight and a half years of your life. And I did that on the Kelkaya ice cap between the time of the concept and before we actually succeeded to drill it in 1983 using solar power. So, so, and, and so uh, the other thing I always tell my students, it's very important at an early age to fail because it's in failure that you, you really pushed to think about, you know, is this what you really want to do? And to think about, okay, how can I accomplish it? Uh, you know, success, you don't learn that much. Failure, you learn a lot. And, so, and it's good to do it when you're young because no one knows who you are. And if you fail, yeah, it's a big deal to you, but it's probably not for the rest of the world. So um, that, that's kind of how we, we got started. And that ice core opened up a whole new field. And uh, we've now drilled in um, 16 countries uh, including Antarctica and Greenland. Uh, we've run, I just finished my 58th expedition to New Guinea. At no other time in human history would it be possible for one human to do this because we move six tons of equipment to these countries and go through customs and get them up to these remote areas and get the ice core back frozen. And um, so, uh, it's amazing, I would have never thought uh, when we started out that this would be possible. But now we have an archive, uh, we have over 7,000 meters 
of core stored at minus 35 degrees in our freezers at Ohio State. It's the only tropical collection on Earth. And no one has duplicated this uh, because of the team. It really comes down to people, the team that we were able to put together that uh, they know what they're getting into, and it's tough working at above 20,000 feet. And, but they're marvelous records. 58 expeditions over four decades. What changes have you seen? Well, the, the glaciers, uh, again, when we started in the 70s, you know, there, no, there was no discussion of global warming. And in fact, they were talking about the coming ice age um, because there had been crops failures in, in uh, what was then the Soviet Union uh, because there had been some cold winters. And uh, so we didn't go there to look at the changing climate as, as much as to understand how a tropical glacier works versus those in the polar region. But in going back to these places, we were able to document the changes that are taking place. And what was really incredible was the initially how slow the glaciers were retreating and then how they have accelerated coming forward in time. And in such that many of the sites that we drilled early in my career have disappeared. And you cannot go get those records now. And therefore the archive we have, I mean, we cut our cores in half and half of them go in the freezer for the future because we know there'll be new techniques, there'll be new ideas, but you're not gonna be able to go out and recover an ice core from the summit of Kilimanjaro in Africa because the ice is not gonna be there. And so uh, I think that has a, uh, when, I, when I look into the future and, and if 100 years from now when I'm all forgotten, I think what will be remembered are the, the quality of the records that have been obtained because those isotope values, those dust measurements, those chemistry measurements, they're not gonna change. The interpretation of those may change, but those records will be there. And then the archive for future generations to work on, uh, uh, to me, is, uh, will be a, a good legacy. Uh, as time uh, proceeded, it became very clear that, uh, especially the lower elevation glaciers, and by that I mean glaciers at 5,000 meters, uh, uh, 18,000 feet, were going to disappear first. And uh, so getting those archives has, has really been, it's, uh, in recent years, it's become almost a salvage mission. When we went to New Guinea, I mean, in the center of this tropical rainforest, I mean, this is middle of nowhere, uh, at, that it was to capture what's left. We should have drilled there in 1935, because we have some old photos, there was a lot of ice there, but, but we, uh, we got a, a, a record at uh, 32 meter cores to bedrock, and uh, they have a marvelous record in them but they, they won't be there. Well, my best guess is that glacier will disappear in 2017, three years from now. It's, I mean, these glaciers, uh, it's not just their area that's shrinking. They're no longer accumulating on top. They're, they're losing mass from the surface down. And to me, this is, a, uh, uh, this is one of the problems of using satellites uh, to measure glaciers, is that you're not really measuring the volume change of that ice. And yet, if you are in the Himalayas, where you have uh, uh, millions of people downstream, depending on water, uh, those glaciers will appear to be there on a satellite image, but they are thinning uh, vertically. One year, there'll be glaciers, and the next year, that glacier will be gone. Uh, on Kilimanjaro, uh, those ice fields are thinning at about half a meter a year from the top down, and so, uh, on the Furtwanger Glacier, if you're looking at it from a satellite in 2017, there will appear to be a glacier. In 2018, just be bedrock uh, because it's, it's, it's going from the top down. So they, uh, uh, I think the implications for water supplies in these remote areas, I mean, uh, if you go to a country like Peru, 70% uh, of the tropical glaciers on Earth are in Peru, in the Andes of Peru. Here you have a country of 34 million people. Over 50% live in the desert on the west coast of Peru, depending on rivers that originate in the glaciers up in the Andes. 76% uh, of their electricity comes from hydropower, 
uh, the water coming from those glaciers. They have a very distinct wet and dry season so that you know, glaciers are kind of like an insurance policy. They accumulate snow uh, during wet seasons and wet periods, and then they melt and release that during droughts and, and dry seasons. But they're getting smaller, so their ability to do that becomes less and less. So this has tremendous implications for people who live in areas that depend on those water resources. Because downstream, that water goes for those hydroelectric plants, it goes into irrigation, goes in the municipal water supplies for cities. And you go to a city like Lima, Peru, that has 15 million people in it, they are looking at uh, putting in tunnels through the Andes to capture water now that goes into the Amazon and bring it back to the West Coast uh, for water supply for, for people. So the implications of the change are, are tremendous uh, in these areas. And the, I think in the tropics, there's, there's where you're going to see the first real impacts on people because the people are living right downstream below the glaciers and, and there are large numbers of people living downstream. So uh, what's happening to those glaciers become extremely important. When I first started working on this and seeing the system change, uh, I think it was 1992 when I uh, first testified at U.S. Senate on climate change. And back then I talked about prevention. So that time has come and gone. I think now it's the mitigation, the adaptation, or the suffering. And so we're, as we go further down this road, our options are becoming uh, less and less of how we deal with these, these changes. Uh, if you're working in Tibet, there are 46,000 glaciers there and you take a river like the Indus River, it flows through China, through Pakistan, and through India, all nuclear power countries, all depend on that river for its water supplies. So these are, these are places of geopolitical hotspots in the future. Uh, you look at population projections for the world, by 2050, 50% of the world's population will live in mega cities in southern China and India. So that water becomes more and more important as we go forward in time. It's interesting that you've uh, studied coal geology and also business school and, and then go into climate science. Yeah. Um, there's a, a common, uh, I guess, uh, argument against to cast doubt on climate science is that climate scientists are only agreeing with the human-caused global warming because they're in it for research. And, I, I have never understood uh, that argument. Anyone who's in science will tell you up front, this is not where you go to make money. Science is it's where you, if you have a passion, you go there to seek that passion, to fulfill uh, a drive that you have within you. And, uh, but I must say that I, I've come to understand skeptics on climate change much better because of an incident that happened now two and a half years ago. Uh, two and a half years ago, uh, uh, I should go back and say, 20 years ago, I was diagnosed with exercise-induced asthma. Uh, and uh, because I, I'd have a hard time breathing uh, um, when I'm doing exercise, and, and that's always an issue when you go to high elevation. But the doctor told me that the good thing about it was that there, uh, if you had the right medicine, there's nothing in the world you couldn't do. So, you know, I'm climbing mountains, drilling ice cores, and, and, but it's getting harder and harder to uh, work at those high elevations. And when I came back from Peru in 2009, I went to the Ross Heart Hospital and I was diagnosed with congestive heart failure. And my cardiologist looked at me and he said, Lonnie, he said, you know, in your future, you have one choice and one choice only. And that is, you're going to have to have a heart transplant. And I looked at him and I said, you're crazy. I've been climbing the highest mountains in the world for, I was 63 years old at the time. And I, I fought this guy every step of the way for, for two years. I mean, I was running expeditions to New Guinea. And I was in the Alps uh, drilling in 2011. And then one day, I couldn't get up from my tent to go to the drill site. Couldn't breathe. And I came down and I en ended up getting out of it Italy back to the Ross Heart Hospital at Ohio State University, went right in the emergency room. They put me in, put, put me initially on a heart pump, 
And uh, then uh, they had to put in an LVAD system, which is a turbine that was invented six years earlier that goes into your old heart and you, uh, uh, you have a computer on the outside and you have a drive line and during the day you run on batteries uh, and at night you plug into the wall. And uh, six months later there was, they found a, what turned out to be a pretty good match and I got a heart transplant. Uh, one year after that, I was in, in 2013, I was at 20,000 feet in uh, West Central Tibet um, uh, doing what my passion is, uh, recovering uh, these records. But I use the story uh, because I believe that I had two things, two options. Uh, the reason I didn't want to believe that it was congestive heart failure is that if you put that on your medical form, there's no way you'd be permitted to go to climb the next mountain to run the next project. So uh, I'd rather believe that it was asthma. And, but the fact is, at the end of the day, we deal with what is. And what is was that I had to have a heart transplant. And when it comes to climate change, we will deal with what is because the system is changing and we will have to deal with it. But unfortunately, as human beings, we don't usually do these things until we have no choice. And, and then sometimes uh, uh, we can still deal with it. Uh, it may be touch and go for a while, uh, but things can get better uh, on the other side. First of all, you know, we work with ice cores. And we have now an 800,000 year history of CO2, methane, nitrous oxide. And, and we know that we have not had uh, levels of CO2 at 400 parts per million by volume in uh, 800,000 years of history. And we know that that's rising about 3.2 parts per million uh, every year. And we know where that CO2 is coming from because we do the isotopes of the carbon. We know it's coming from fossil fuels. So we know we're changing the composition of our atmosphere. We know the temperature of the Earth is going up because we have thermometers all over the world. and. We have a record that goes back 130 years to document the, that fact that temperatures are going up. At the same time, the glaciers all over the world are melting and retreating. And uh, that's what you would expect if the world was getting warmer. And that water is flowing into the world's oceans and sea level is rising. And the rate of sea level rise is, is accelerating as the rate of glacier melt accelerates. So, the evidence is very clear where, where we're headed and the fact that uh, the humans are driving it. It's a, it's a matter of uh, physics and chemistry. And at the end of the day, science is about what is. And what is, is we're changing the climate system. How long it takes us to actually make meaningful uh, advances on dealing with this problem to me is is the only question. Uh, the fact that we will deal with it is a given.